Hello, my name is Sarah Reid and I'm a lecturer at Loughborough University and today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how women experience pregnancy and childbirth in the Civil War era. So how did you even know you were pregnant in the first place? Well, Nicholas Culpepper, an apocryphy and medical writer in the Civil War, said that you shouldn't rely on a lack of periods to know that you're pregnant because some women have them all the way through their pregnancy um, without it hurting the pregnancy at all so he thinks it's unreliable what he thinks is better is that if you go by when you first experience cravings or sickness and things like that from the fourth month the child would start to move within the mother's womb and that was the surest sign that was the um that was when you knew for definite that you were pregnant if you wanted to know if you had a boy or a girl in your womb, you might think about the way that you could feel the baby lying. Boys, he says, lie on the right side and girls lie on the left. Mm -hmm. 17th century depictions of the fetus in the uterus are quite different from the modern drawings that we see today. And as you can see in the modern one below, the infant takes up most of the mother's abdomen. Whereas in the ones from the 17th century, you can see that the children are depicted with adult proportions. And these were known as bottle baby pictures quite often. And the reason for this was that they were meant to be representations. They weren't meant to be true to life, but they were to give practitioners an idea of the kind of presentations they might see when they're helping women in labour. Now, if a woman was concerned that she might be going to miscarry, then that her midwife would recommend treatments to warm the womb such as placing warm toast on her tummy and the reason for this was because by warming the abdomen the womb would be inclined they thought to rise up and go towards the warmth and in doing so would suck in and protect its contents more closely as a woman's due date approached there was lots of advice in midwifery guides about what she should do to prepare herself for her labour. And one book written in 1540 suggested that from about 10 days before she feels it's time um, for her baby to come, she should start to wash or bathe every day with warm water, but not for too long because she didn't want to weaken herself. But this water wasn't just to be um, bubbly. It was to be infused with things like marshmallow herbs and things that would make the body more loose and therefore help her to have an easier time when her time came. The Bible view that labour pains were a punishment for Eve's sin was still widely held. Midwife Jane Sharp, who wrote a midwifery guide in 1671 based on her own 30 years in practice, says the same. She said it was a curse that was visited on womankind because of Mother Eve's sin. That said, if a woman was having an especially hard labour or was really suffering under her pains, there were lots of medicines and remedies that were recommended to try and ease and take the edge off her pains. So Nicholas Culpepper again, he says, start with gentle things like cinnamon water. Uh, and move on to stronger treatments if these don't help. And you could finish up with something like um, some of the mineral borax uh, mixed into some sack, which is a fortified sweet Spanish wine, and see if that takes the edge off her pains. Other more unusual treatments perhaps were known as suffumigations, and these are where you take ingredients and you burn them. Uh, in a chafing dish under the chair that the mother sits. So as you can see from this picture in the bottom right, mm -hmm. the mother would sit over a chair with an opening and the fumes or the smoke, the medicated smoke, would rise up and go directly into her birth canal. And that was thought to help um, hasten and speed up the delivery. Some midwives used hollow geodes, which were called eagle stones, that they thought were useful for two things. So if a miscarriage or the baby was thought to be coming early, you might uh, put it on the mother's tummy and that might slow labour down. But also if you wanted to speed up labour, you might tie it to the woman's thigh to encourage the baby to come down. Now the way they were thought to work is because they were a hollow stone with a little stone inside it that rattled when you shook it. And 
this was thought to look like a baby in uterus and so work by sympathy because it had the same qualities as a child in the womb. Unless she was poorly, all women in this era gave birth sitting or standing up. Most commonly, she would sit on the edge of her bed, but sometimes um, she would sit in a birth chair or stool, like one of these that you can see on the screen. So they range from quite simple V-shaped uh, dairy stools, if you like, to more complex ones like the one in the middle. They would sometimes have a cloth around the bottom um, tacked on, so this would keep air out and, and protect the baby as it came out. This birthing stool, as you can see from the pictures of the Science Museum in London, is a much more sophisticated stool chair. It's got silk damask coverings and leather. It's got knobs on for the woman to hold on to when the pains are ramping up and she needs to grip. They're also quite low down all birthing stools so that she could brace against the floor when her pains uh, meant that she was at the point of starting to push. And you can see this chair folds into several positions to make it more comfortable for the mother. This would have been used by your higher ranking, your upper class woman. And you can go and see this one at the National Civil War Centre where it's on display. Midwives were supposed to bring with them several things, including the stool, if she'd got one, um, but also scissors, sponges, pillows, and various oils, and also other women skilled in this mystery. So it was important that the labouring woman had a group of female companions around her. The oils the midwife would use to um, anoint her hand and arm and the birth canal um, to help loosen it up, help open it, to help the baby slip out more easily. Um, midwives who didn't have access to these oils would often use chicken fat or any grease that they could get hold of. And on the screen you can see some 17th century scissors and some lilies. As I said, as well as the midwife, the mother was supported and helped by her female friends and relations. These were known as her gossips and they were hugely important to giving birth. They would hold you up if you were sat on the end of the bed. They would keep your spirits up. They would laugh and joke and encourage you. They would rub your tummy as, as you were bearing down and they would help you recover after the birth. If you'd had a hard labour, you might be given a hair skin that was newly taken from the hair um, and placed on your tummy for an hour or two hours to help encourage the womb to go back to its normal position. You might also be laying on a nice soft sheepskin to keep you warm and to help prevent uh, shock. After she'd given birth, the mother was expected to spend several weeks convalescing, the so-called woman's month. And this would be a staged affair. So for the first few days, she would be expected to lay flat. Then she could sit up, which was known as up sitting, an exciting moment when the woman was considered to have recovered enough to sit up. And then after a week or so, she might be able to potter in her bedroom, her chamber, and eventually she would be doing light duties around the house. Certainly not going outside, not until the end of the woman's month. And in the picture on screen, you can see how her women are helping her. There's um, a woman bathing the baby, another ready to receive the child. Uh, the toddler's rocking the cradle. Um, there's a woman giving the new mother some cordial and another one offering her a drink. And you can see sitting by some people enjoying some celebratory food and drink at what was known as a gossiping to celebrate the successful delivery.